Welcome back to season two of What Your GP Doesn't Tell You, the podcast for both doctors and patients with me, Liz Tucker. Thank you so much, everyone, for your good wishes while I was ill, hence the delay in this latest episode. And there's been a slight change to the order of the next few podcasts, too. So today's episode is with psychiatrist Dr. Georgia Ede, who's pioneering the use of low carb, otherwise known as ketogenic diets, to help treat a range of mental illnesses. A Harvard-trained psychiatrist, Georgia spent many years becoming increasingly frustrated that the standard approaches of psychotherapy and medication were simply not producing the results for patients that she'd hoped. She's now treated hundreds using a low-carb diet. And a recently published paper on which she was an author suggests this low-carb approach may have real potential. A group of 28 patients who had either major depression, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder were put on this diet. These patients had tried multiple medications with very little improvement, but 43% went into total remission and 64% were discharged on less medication. It's almost unheard of to see results like this. So if these are replicated, this approach could have a huge impact on psychiatric care in the future. But before we get to George's interview, a brief request from me. If you enjoy this podcast, it would be a huge help if you could leave a review on Apple and Spotify. And if you could share and recommend it to friends and family, that would also be much appreciated. You can also join the podcast mailing list and be the first to find out when a new pod is published by signing up at my website, whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com, where you can also find out more about the podcast. And you can get further details too in my Substack newsletter, liztucker.substack.com, and follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker. If in the coming weeks you feel able to support the show, even if it's just a five or a month, that would be a great help. You can either sign up on patreon.com slash what your GP doesn't tell you, or via PayPal on my website, what your GP doesn't tell you.com. Now back to the interview with Georgia. Dr. Georgia Ede trained at Harvard then worked at the Harvard University Health Services and later Smith College, before setting up her own psychiatric nutritional practice in 2018. This helps patients reduce or eliminate the use of medications by changing what they eat. Georgia believes that a low-carb or ketogenic diet is key in this treatment. When patients go on this diet, it raises the level of chemicals in their bodies called ketones. This produces a metabolic state known as ketosis. And ketosis occurs when the body burns fat for energy instead of glucose. Georgia argues this is a much healthier diet for the brain. Here's her interview. So, Georgia, thanks so much for joining the podcast today. Thank you very much for inviting me, Liz. It's a pleasure to meet you and to speak with your listeners today. So for a long time, Georgia, there's been evidence that ketogenic diets can be helpful in treating epilepsy. So what made you think they might also be helpful for treating mental health? So the fact that we have over 100 years now of clinical experience of successfully treating treatment-resistant seizure disorders, epilepsy, particularly in children, the ketogenic diet was first invented, created to try to manage epilepsy in children long before we had the plethora of of seizure medications that we do today. More than half of children following a ketogenic diet achieved more than 50% seizure control when nothing else had worked. If that isn't strong evidence that the ketogenic diet stabilizes brain chemistry, (laughs) I'm not sure what would be. The other really interesting thing about epilepsy and psychiatry, the connection between a condition that's considered neurological, like epilepsy, and a condition that's considered psychiatric, like bipolar disorder, they actually are very, very similar conditions. In fact, I like to refer to bipolar disorder as emotional epilepsy, meaning that you can have unpredictable shifts in mood, just as you can have an unpredictable activity of a muscle group, for example, with a seizure. And so the biochemical underpinnings of epilepsy and bipolar disorder are strikingly similar, further evidenced by the fact that, and every prescribing psychiatric professional knows this, the medications we use to treat bipolar disorder, many of them are seizure medications, they're anticonvulsant medications. And so that that helps us understand the, the very, very strong overlap between the two conditions. And we're starting to understand now 
in psychiatry through our own clinical experiences, the small number of us who do this kind of work, as well as emerging case reports and small clinical trials, the ketogenic diet can be a powerful intervention for psychiatric conditions that we used to think of as chronic, mysterious, and incurable. And I think a lot of people tend to see this as slightly sort of fringe. But up to then, you'd been a very conventional psychiatrist, you're Harvard educated, and you'd been used to a typical process of prescribing medication for a wide range of psychiatric illnesses. And that's right. I mean, I practiced conventionally, you know, using psychiatric medications and psychotherapy for 10 years. It just never occurred to me that nutrition would have an influence on mental health. I never thought of it as influencing the mental health of my many, many patients, many of whom were not improving, despite all of my training and every medication at my disposal, pouring my heart and soul in, into my psychotherapy work. I mean, I loved my work, but most people were not getting that much better. And I think psychiatric professionals, we, we recognize that. We recognize that most of our practices are filling up with people who aren't getting better. And that's a really really disheartening experience for clinicians as well as for patients. So when you first started to think about using diet to treat these patients, did your colleagues think you'd lost your mind? <laughs> some of them still do. Some of them, <laughs> Many of my colleagues, including some good friends of mine, have the sense that I am practicing beyond my scope and that there isn't enough evidence. And they're worried that you might get patients to start sitting under pyramids or something. <laughs> yeah. And so but both in terms of moving away from conventional care, that's one step over the line, but then also recommending a diet, a particular type of diet, as opposed to maybe a plant-based diet or a Mediterranean diet or what the USDA recommends as a healthy dietary pattern. I'm not recommending those diets either. So I've stepped beyond my bounds in two different ways. I'm perfectly comfortable with that. I feel that the evidence is very, very strong for ketogenic diets and, and other types of diets. I use other dietary strategies in my practice as well. But the evidence behind the safety and efficacy of ketogenic diets for improving brain health, st stabilizing brain chemistry, reducing inflammation, reducing oxidative stress, and improving insulin resistance and brain metabolism, these are the root causes of many of these neuropsychiatric illnesses in the first place. I feel that I'm on very solid ground. In fact, on much more solid ground than many of my colleagues who are practicing in a different way. And I mean no disrespect to any of my colleagues. I simply think that physicians do not have the right information. They do not have the training, the information, sometimes often the time to explore these, these other approaches, which can be just life-changing and practice-changing. It feels completely different to practice this way, and it feels completely different for patients to, to work in this way. Now, initially, when you started looking at diet, you were actually working at Harvard and the institution seemed quite supportive, but that I think then changed. It did. So when I first started working there at the Harvard University Health Service, the director at the time was very supportive of all of the psychiatrists on staff offering other approaches in addition to the main reason we were hired was medication management. You know, there were a, a number of wonderful therapists who were hired to provide psychotherapy, but the MDs and the nurse practitioners were hired to prescribe medications primarily. But this director allowed some of us to do other things, uh, acupuncture, nutrition, et cetera. I, my personal interest was nutrition. But then the leadership changed and a new director came on board. And within days, I was called into the office and told that the strategies that I was using with some of my patients who were interested, mind you, not with everybody, just with those who were interested, were beyond the scope of practice and that I needed to stop immediately. Now, that director is no longer there, so I, I want to say that. But this was so, so discouraging and ultimately led to my leaving Harvard and moving to a different college. I specialized in college mental health. So I went to Smith College where at first, they were open to these ideas as well, although that eventually met with resistance from the dietitian and the wellness department at Smith, where I again got called into the office simply for recommending, I wasn't trying to put students at Smith College on a ketogenic diet, simply for recommending that we take a look at how much sugar was in their diet and maybe try to try to cut back or perhaps even eliminate refined carbohydrates, sweets, and things like that. Were you not able to say, but hang on a moment? Look at how my patients are doing. 
Well, the reason why I ultimately left college mental health, and that was in 2018, was because it was very difficult. It's a very difficult environment in which to practice nutritional psychiatry, partly because the culture, the eating culture on college campuses is really unhealthy. So it's quite difficult to convince students to make a change to the way they eat. The way that college students eat pizza and smoothies and sweetened coffees and ice cream and cookies and cake, just sugar basically all day long for most students in in one form or another, refined carbohydrates. That culture is bolstered by the dining halls, what the dining halls offer. There are sweet desserts available at every meal and even by wellness departments and very, very well-meaning you know, wellness departments and educators who lure students to events with refined carbohydrates. I honestly believe that this is not malicious. This is not, you know, that that anybody is trying to harm students. Students come to school to learn. It is much more difficult to learn, to remember, to maintain good mood, to get good sleep, to have good energy, uh, to have good, robust physical and mental health if they are eating these foods, which literally damage the brain's ability to access energy. And what's interesting is if you look at a number of mental illnesses, there seems to be an association with diabetes. And of course, an association doesn't necessarily mean causation. Well, there's some wonderful research coming out now showing that there is a very strong, not just coincidental connection between metabolic health and mental health. Dr. Cynthia Kalkin, who's a researcher in Nova Scotia, studies the impact of a medication called metformin. It's a very common uh, medication prescribed for metabolic issues, particularly type 2 diabetes. It helps with insulin resistance. Insulin resistance goes by many names, but this is often also called prediabetes or metabolic syndrome or so early metabolic syndrome or hyperinsulinemia, meaning high blood insulin levels. She studies the effect of that drug on people with bipolar disorder and 50% of those people responded. All of the people whose insulin resistance improved on metformin, their bipolar symptoms improved as well. So if the insulin resistance improved, the bipolar symptoms also improved. That study just came out last year, was really meticulously conducted. That gives us very strong scientific basis for addressing insulin resistance however you can, however you choose to do that, whether it's with a medication or with a lifestyle intervention or with a combination of both. It really gives people with mood disorders hope that, you know, maybe this isn't a lifelong untreatable condition. Maybe this is a metabolic condition. Maybe if I improve my metabolic health, I can improve my mental health. Because basically with insulin resistance, what happens when we eat sugar, our body produces insulin to lower the sugar levels back down again. But if we continually eat too much sugar, it's pushing up our insulin levels artificially high. That's exactly right. So, you know, with the body was never designed to be able to handle large amounts of refined carbohydrates all day and well into the night. Many people are eating foods like sugar, flour, fruit juices, and refined cereal products, and refined grains and white rice and breakfast cereals and things like that, really three, four, five, six times a day, and especially children. I mean, these foods are considered foods for children. The body isn't designed to be able to cope with that level of sugar intake. And so the amount of insulin that your body has to produce to manage all of that that sort of flood of glucose molecules coming into the bloodstream is quite high. And so your blood sugar can remain normal. Your fasting morning blood sugar, which is the test that most physicians use to look at your metabolic health, that morning blood sugar can be normal, perfectly normal for many, many years before you develop diabetes because your insulin levels are climbing higher and higher and higher to keep your blood sugar normal. So what you want to really look at is your fasting insulin level, because that is going to tell you how hard your body is working to try to keep things under control. And those high insulin levels are very damaging over time in and of themselves, glucose aside. Those high insulin levels damage the brain's ability to process glucose and turn it into energy. It's a very slow silent, insidious process for the brain as well as the entire body. 
while the rest of the cells in the body need insulin to push sugar into them. In the brain, that isn't the case. So if you're eating a high sugar diet, the brain can literally become bathed in sugar. That's exactly right. I think this is a very, very helpful concept to explain. Most organs in the body cannot absorb glucose without the help of insulin. The brain is different. The brain must have access to some glucose at all times in order to function properly. It's, a, it's an energy hog. It demands 10 times more energy than you would expect for an organ of its size. It cannot afford to put any barriers in the way of obtaining glucose. So the brain absorbs glucose without any help from insulin. Glucose waltzes into the brain, no questions asked, no insulin required. The problem is that the brain can't process glucose without adequate insulin, can't turn glucose into energy or parts or anything else it needs. And if your insulin levels are running too high too often, what will happen is the insulin receptors on the surface of the blood-brain barrier, which escort insulin into the brain, those receptors become less effective. They become damaged. They become fewer in number. It becomes harder and harder for insulin to cross into the brain. And then what you've got, as you started to suggest, your brain could be swimming in a sea of glucose and still be starving to death because of poor insulin access. And that happens as a result of bombarding those insulin receptors with too much insulin three, four, five, six times a day for years and years on end until you start to have signs of depression or Alzheimer's disease or some other neurodegenerative condition or mood, memory, or concentration disorder. It's very, very serious. So if someone comes to see you and they want to take a nutritional approach, what is the typical diet that you would recommend for someone with, say, bipolar? Yes, there are many different approaches that you can recommend depending on the person. So is this a person who is interested in trying a ketogenic diet? Because not everybody is. For some people, if you tell them that, you know, you, you're going to recommend lowering their carbohydrate intake to extremely low levels, for some people, that's a non-starter. And as a clinician, I have to offer other strategies for those people, at least in the beginning, until we get to know each other better. There are many different approaches. And the other thing is that a ketogenic diet is not appropriate for everybody. I teach a CME continuing medical education course for clinicians to, to teach how to use, safely use ketogenic diets in people with mental health concerns. In most people, the ketogenic diet is safe for most adults, provided that you have the information that you need to, to monitor health and medications safely. And so, if a person comes to me ready to try a ketogenic diet and they are also an appropriate candidate for a ketogenic diet, then what I like to do is gradually change the diet over a number of weeks to arrive at a ketogenic diet that sort of uh, minimizes some of the uncomfortable transitional side effects that can occur when the body's adjusting to a new way of eating. So in terms of the keto diet that you're recommending, what foods would that include? Ah, okay. So the way that I think about diet and what a healthy ketogenic diet should look like, you should follow the same principles as any diet should. I consider a brain healthy diet needs to meet three criteria. It needs to nourish the brain by providing all essential nutrients. It needs to protect the brain from damaging ingredients. And it needs to energize the brain safely over a lifespan in ways that protect brain metabolism. If you're thinking along those lines, what makes the most sense is to nourish the brain, you must include some animal food in the diet or supplement extremely carefully. And to protect the brain, you need to exclude damaging ingredients, the most important of which are the refined carbohydrates and the refined seed oils or what cleverly called vegetable oils. These promote inflammation, oxidative stress, insulin resistance, which are root causes of mental health conditions. And then you need to energize the brain over a lifetime, which means keeping your blood glucose and insulin levels in a healthy range. And so if you're following a ketogenic diet that follows these principles, ketogenic diet would be a whole foods, in my opinion, whole foods, pre-agricultural diet that includes some animal foods and should be very low in carbohydrate, moderate in protein, and high in fat, healthy fats. And it would exclude grains. 
agricultural staples such as grains, legumes, and dairy products, we are poorly adapted to utilizing those foods for energy and for nutrition. And they're very nutrient poor, and they are very high high in anti-nutrients and and high in carbohydrates. Those foods are riskier. And so I do recommend ideally removing those for best results. So you touched on if someone is taking medication, you will have to kind of monitor that carefully. What sort of impact does that have when you're treating someone with a ketogenic diet? What makes the ketogenic diet such a powerful and effective intervention is that it can lower blood glucose and insulin levels very quickly. This means it can lower blood pressure very quickly as well. You can see a lot of changes in fluid and electrolyte balance, et cetera. So for people, for example, who are taking medications that lower blood sugar Those medications are going to need to be very closely monitored, especially in the beginning, because if you combine a blood glucose lowering medication, such as insulin, with a blood glucose lowering diet, as the ketogenic diet, you can see even within 24 hours, a very sharp drop in glucose and sometimes to dangerously low levels. That's not because the diet is dangerous. That's because the medications in combination with the diet are dangerous. You don't see those types of things happening. You don't see dangerous, dangerously low blood glucose levels when people are adapting to a ketogenic diet who are not taking blood glucose lowering medications. That's a medication issue. But if you're not aware of this, you can really run into to problems quite quickly if you're prescribing a ketogenic diet to patients. And in fact, a few months ago, you published a paper on 28 patients in France using this approach, which I should make clear, didn't have a control group but does appear to show strong effect. Can you explain what the results showed? Yes, this was the work of my colleague, Dr. Albert Danan, a psychiatrist in Toulouse, France. And he placed 31 of his patients initially uh, on a ketogenic diet in a hospital setting. These were patients with treatment-resistant serious mental illnesses, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and major depression. And many of these patients he had worked with for many, many years, if not decades in some cases, all of these patients had tried multiple medications with very little improvement over many, many years. And they had all been hospitalized before, they had all taken medications before, they had all been in psychotherapy before, et cetera. And so what he said is, would you be willing to try a ketogenic diet to see if that might help, just out of curiosity to see if it might be useful? Three people were not able to stay on the diet for uh, long enough to be followed. But of the 28 patients who did follow the diet, 12 of them had bipolar disorder, six had major depression, and 10 had a type of schizophrenia called schizoaffective disorder, which is a combination of psychosis and mood symptoms. So he placed them on a very simple ketogenic diet, these 28 patients ultimately, which was 15 to 20% protein, 75 to 80% fat, about 5% carbohydrate. The meals were provided by the hospital dietitian under his instruction. And 100% of those patients saw their mental health symptoms improve. 43% of them achieved clinical remission. Clinical remission with this uh, intervention, 96% of them lost weight. And any clinician out there who's ever prescribed antipsychotic medication knows That is extremely difficult. All of these patients, I think with one exception, were taking antipsychotic medications while they were on the ketogenic diet. 64% of patients were discharged on less medication. And anybody who has any experience in the field with people going in and out of hospitals knows you do not see these kinds of results with conventional care. The metabolic health of these patients improved as well. Things like blood pressure and triglycerides and fasting glucose levels, not just weight. These need to be replicated in a controlled fashion. There was no control group. And I think that's really important, as you pointed out, very important to point out. But what this tells us is that the ketogenic diet is safe. People tolerated this diet very well. It was feasible to implement in a hospital setting. And it was associated with remarkable improvements that these patients, all of whom had been hospitalized at least once before under the care of this very same psychiatrist, I want to impress upon people what a low risk, high potential benefit intervention this is. 
why not use this intervention, particularly in people who are not responding to conventional care, even if people do not improve psychiatrically on a ketogenic diet. What our study seems to suggest is that you can get tremendous improvements in the metabolic side effects of the psychiatric medications, which are known, they're notorious for causing weight gain, for causing type 2 diabetes, high blood sugar levels, high triglyceride levels, all of these things that we like to group together and call metabolic syndrome. So they can improve quality of life, even for people who are continuing to take psychiatric medications. Because that's what I was surprised when I read the paper, was that the average patient on the study was taking five psychotropic drugs. I mean, that seems to me a large number. This is not at all unusual, particularly for people with serious chronic mental illness. Many of them end up on a mixture of usually at least one antipsychotic medication, a mood stabilizer, an antidepressant, sometimes something for sleep, sometimes something as needed for anxiety. It is not uncommon because we didn't have any other options. We didn't know what else to do. This medicine helps a little bit with this, and this medicine helps a little bit with that. You're trying to get the best possible outcome for that patient using all the tools in your toolbox. If your tools are psychotherapy and medication, that's what you use. I mean, my gosh, I practiced like that for 10 years. I think that if you understand that there's another tool in the toolbox, a, a really powerful, very safe, that could be either added to your conventional strategies or in certain cases, even replace some of the medications that are being taken. Those of us who practice this way in, in outpatient care, some of us, including myself, have seen patients come completely off all of their psychiatric medication or be able to avoid taking psychiatric medication in the first place. And just looking at the group of patients who had major depression in your study, the amount they improved in terms of Hamilton points is actually much greater than the improvement one sees on a classic drug trial, which I think is usually around about average of nine to 10 points. And you were reporting, I think, around 18 points. So it's almost double the effect. It's really remarkable the degree of improvement where we far exceeded what's considered the minimally clinically significant difference that you want to see in a drug trial, we far exceeded that in every case, really, so that with each condition, with depression, with bipolar disorder, and with schizophrenia, the improvements were really striking. If this intervention were a pill, it would be a multi-billion dollar industry within a number of months. The problem is, of course, I understand this. I follow a ketogenic diet myself. I know that it can be difficult. It's much easier to take a pill, of course, than to change your diet. It can be very difficult to change your diet. It involves some sacrifice. It involves some hard work. It involves some commitment. I understand it's a lot easier to prescribe a pill, and it's a lot easier to take a pill. In your clinical experience, Georgia, does it make a difference in terms of the type of mental illness you have? Almost without exception, no. So I have had patients with ADHD, with obsessive compulsive disorder, with bipolar disorder, with early Alzheimer's disease, with major depression, with generalized anxiety disorder. I've had many patients respond to this dietary intervention. It's not 100% of patients, but in my clinical experience, having worked with hundreds of patients now, I would say that 95% of people improve to some noticeable extent. And how would that compare with patients that you give medication to solely? Oh my gosh. Meaning I try one medication and then wait and see how it goes, or meaning that I work with them for five years and we try 10 different medications. Well, we that you work with them for a period of time. What the success rate is after that and the process that you go through? Yeah. So I would say um, maybe two thirds. I mean, I'm really guessing here because I've never done the math or gone back over my charts, but maybe two thirds of patients uh, in the 20 years or so that I've been prescribing medication, two thirds of patients will experience some degree of relief. Ultimately, if you try different categories of medications, antidepressants, anxiety medications, antipsychotic medications, mood stabilizers, stimulants, you eventually, if you work hard enough at it and the person sticks with you, you can usually find some combination of the right dosages for that person 
to bring some sort of relief, but it's almost always at the cost of significant side effects. And of course, cost in terms of financial cost as well. So at least here in the United States, these medications can be extremely expensive. Medications can be helpful. I, I've seen that with my own eyes too many times to discount. But this dietary intervention, what's so important about it, it's not just trying to change the level of one particular neurotransmitter in the brain that we think might be off kilter. What it's doing is it's improving the health, the metabolic health of the entire brain. And how can that not be beneficial? It's improving the brain's access to energy. It's reducing inflammation. It's reducing what's called oxidative stress, which is a very damaging process in the brain that can be excessive if you're eating the wrong way. It even improves nutrient availability and stabilizes nerve cell networks and improves the brain's ability to grow and nurture new cells. It attacks the root causes of mental health conditions, of brain health conditions on multiple fronts a single intervention with few, if any, side effects once you've adapted to it, as compared to a medication which tries to adjust one single aspect of brain chemistry. Sometimes it's able to do that, sometimes it's not, with multiple downstream negative effects on brain health and on physical health. So, Georgia, for those patients who think, gosh, I just can't get my diet down to 20 grams of carbohydrate, that sounds unlivable. If they cut sugar and refined carbohydrates from their diet, even if they don't go sort of full keto, will they still see some benefit? In many cases, there can be some benefit. And I've seen that in my own practice, for example. So when I'm working with people who, like you said, you know, they just don't want to, they don't want to lower their carbohydrate to 20 grams. The first thing we do is we clean up the diet, get as much of the junk out as you possibly can, and just try to eat real whole foods meat, seafood, poultry, eggs, nuts, vegetables, fruits, try to eat foods with single ingredient that you would recognize in nature, foods that perish, foods that go bad, food with a shelf life that don't need an ingredient label. A banana doesn't need an ingredient label. A piece of steak doesn't need an ingredient label. Eat those foods. And, and that often makes a big difference. And I actually believe that this is probably, I mean, we can't say for sure because it hasn't been tested, but I believe this is the major reason why the Mediterranean diet can be helpful. In depression, for example, it's been shown to be helpful in major depression is because it's a much healthier diet. It removes most of the, not all, but many of the refined carbohydrates and vegetable oils. And I've had some patients, for example, teenagers of course, you know, many of them are not going to eat a low carbohydrate diet, but what can be helpful is again, taking the junk out, eating a healthier diet will improve your brain's access to nutrients, will soften those blood sugar spikes, get those insulin levels down a little bit. And you can see significant improvements in mental health, particularly in younger people or people who are metabolically healthier, athletes often, or people just who haven't had a lot of metabolic damage in their life yet. But if you already have, which unfortunately most of us now do, a significant degree of metabolic damage, meaning that your insulin is not able to cross into the brain as well as it used to be, and therefore your brain can't process glucose as well as it used to be able to, in those cases, unfortunately, you've lost the ability to process even healthy forms of carbohydrate properly and to be able to access its energy for your brain. In those cases, if you lower your glucose intake down, your carbohydrate intake down, in most cases to 20 grams a day, that lowers insulin levels enough for the body to produce ketones. And those ketones cross into the brain easily and they pick up the slack. The brain can burn a combination of glucose and ketones. And the rest of the cells and pathways that can run beautifully on ketones will do so. And that's why people, when they switch to a ketogenic diet, many of them say, I had no idea I could feel this way. It's, it's like my brain turned on for the first time. Because we don't need to eat glucose. Our body will make glucose anyway. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's really important. The brain does need some glucose at all times. There's no question about it. But that doesn't mean you need to eat carbohydrates to furnish the brain with glucose because when your insulin levels are low, the liver will turn on a process called gluconeogenesis. 
which is just means making glucose from scratch. And you will make glucose reliably, smoothly, without any peaks or valleys or drama, 24-7 out of protein and fat molecules. So you never need to worry about that. You don't need to worry that your brain isn't going to get enough glucose. What you need to worry about is that your brain's not going to be able to get enough insulin. Now, Georgia, as you know, there are a number of different schools of psychiatry. You've got the psychiatrists who argue that depression, historically have argued that it's to do with various chemical imbalances in the brain, and others who argue that actually the root of people's mental health problems is all due to life experiences. So are you saying that these life experiences are less important than we thought? Our external environment, how we were raised, what kinds of experiences we've had, particularly traumatic experiences, psychological trauma, sexual trauma, military trauma, and even physical trauma, brain injuries, these external factors are, of course, very important. Our external environment matters a great deal. And so ultimately what you want is a healthy external environment as well as a healthy internal environment. And the internal environment you can control almost entirely through lifestyle, diet, exercise, not smoking, uh, not drinking, uh, getting fresh air, getting sunlight, and being in healthy relationships, enjoying your work, achieving your goals, surrounding yourself with good people. So lots of different things play into this. But if your internal metabolic health is not in order, it will not matter what else you do to try to help yourself. There will be a limit to what you can accomplish. There's a limit to what meditation and psychotherapy and mindset habits, there's a limit to, to what those can accomplish because those processes cannot improve your brain's access to energy. And so the combination of the two, it, it shouldn't be an either or. This is certainly not a contest about which paradigm is most important. They're both important. And so if you want really robust mental health, you must have a healthy external environment and a healthy internal environment. And depending on how much insulin resistance you've built up on your body, you may need to make greater or smaller changes to your diet. That's right. I mean, one of the things that we we need research, like really carefully conducted research trials on ketogenic diets to answer, we need to understand who responds best to this diet? Does everybody need to be in ketosis? And what depth of ketosis is required for this condition, that condition, the other condition? How can we give people better information about saying, well, oh, you're more likely to respond to this type of a diet, or you or you may not need to be on a ketogenic diet, perhaps you just need to do X, Y, and Z. We don't have that level of information yet. And there are research studies underway being funded by the Bazuki Brain Research Fund They are funding clinical trials in this area, and they are growing a community of metabolically minded clinicians, researchers, and patients, as well as entrepreneurs, to try to bring these interventions into the limelight through funding and through advocacy work and education. So for those of us with and without mental illness, is it useful for all of us to measure our glucose levels? Absolutely. It's very, very important to understand where your metabolic health sits right now. And it's really easy to do. So for example, most people have already had as part of their routine care, you've probably already had a fasting lipid panel. It's a so-called cholesterol test, right? Where you can, you can look at your triglycerides, your HDL cholesterol. You can use the information in that panel to estimate your current metabolic health. So for example, your HDL cholesterol, you want it, if you're male, you want it to be above 40 milligrams per deciliter or 1.04 millimole per liter. If you're female, higher than 50 milligrams per deciliter or 1.3 millimole. And your triglycerides should ideally be under 100 milligrams per deciliter, which is below 1.13 millimole. And then you can take your triglycerides, divide them by your HDL. So triglycerides over HDL, divide those. You want that to be nice and low. The closer to one, the better. The higher it is above 1.5, the more likely it is that you have insulin resistance. But you can also directly measure your own glucose levels now. You can do that at home with a finger stick. You can test your morning glucose before you've eaten breakfast. And hopefully that is in the non-diabetic range. I think more useful than that 
is to test your blood sugar about an hour after you eat what's a typical meal for you. And if that meal contains carbohydrate, you want to see how much your glucose level went up in response to that meal, because the higher it goes after a meal, the less likely it is that you're that you're in good metabolic health. You really want to see your blood sugar never go above 140 milligrams per deciliter, even after eating a meal. I think that's about 7.7 millimole, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. A little bit lower than that is even better. A wonderful tool, if you can access it, is a continuous glucose monitor, where you can see what's happening to your blood sugar levels virtually in real time by using a painless skin sensor that you can just slap on the back of your arm, that'll give you about 10 days worth in most cases with most sensors, about 10 days worth of data. Uh, You can see what's happening to your glucose levels even in the middle of the night. And so if you see a lot of instability or if you see a lot of peaks going above, say, 125 milligrams per deciliter, then you need to take a closer look at, at your diet and make changes that will keep your glucose levels in a healthier range around the clock. And if you find that it's high and you go on a ketogenic diet for a while, is there any evidence that you can use the, the ketogenic diet to reduce your insulin resistance so you can then go back to a less restrictive diet later? It's a really good and interesting and important question. There are two pieces of information that we have to begin to answer that question but we do already have some information that's hopeful. So for example, in children with epilepsy, when they follow a ketogenic diet for a number of years, two to five years, they can often go off the diet and never have another seizure again. There is a certain degree of healing that occurs on a ketogenic diet, particularly, I would argue, in your younger, healthier, more metabolically flexible patients. In my patients, what I've seen in some cases when people are able to follow the diet long enough is that they can start after, again, a certain degree of healing has taken place. This is what we are imagining is happening. They can start relaxing their diet without as many symptoms as they used to. That does not happen in every case. In most cases, I'm working with adults with significant metabolic dysfunction who have already tried a number of of other interventions without success. These patients are less metabolically flexible, they're less uh, metabolically resilient. And every time they go off the diet, their symptoms come right back. But I do have a handful of patients who after a period of say six to 12 months seem to notice they've got more leeway. They've got more wiggle room. They can't go back to eating the way they were before, but that there's more flexibility available. The line is in a different place. I would argue you want to be really careful (laughs) you know, not to, not to, uh, to yeah, relax square too much one. because that you'll be, you'll be doing damage again. But yes, I think there is a lot of hope for, especially if you're younger, more metabolically flexible, or you're an athlete, physical activity does improve metabolic health to a significant extent. Now, one of the toughest mental illnesses to treat can be anorexia. Now, obviously, <sighs> if you're dealing with somebody who's got an eating disorder, putting restrictions on diet comes with an additional levels of complexity. Yes, I'm really glad you mentioned anorexia because that is one of the conditions where I do not recommend a ketogenic diet for a number of reasons. So if we're talking about somebody who's underweight with active symptoms of anorexia, you should not prescribe a ketogenic diet. One of the most sort of common sense reasons, if you think about it, is that most people with anorexia are malnourished. They are starving they are already in ketosis. They do not need more ketones. What they need is more food. And so we can talk a lot about, well, which foods should those be? But we should not be addressing this condition primarily with a ketogenic diet. And whether or not a really carefully constructed ketogenic diet where all of those ketones were coming from dietary fat as opposed to body fat, was there certainly there's not, you don't have anything to spare there. You don't want the person to be eating a diet that's going to promote them burning their own body fat. If you were to very carefully construct, I get this question all the time in my training program. If you were to very carefully construct a healthy whole foods, high calorie ketogenic diet, where all those ketones in their bloodstream were coming from dietary fat, as opposed to body fat, wouldn't that be healing for, wouldn't that be a wonderful treatment for anorexia? I think, well, theoretically, perhaps, but that's a research question. That is not a clinical question. Refeeding somebody with anorexia is a very dangerous, uh, medically very dangerous proposition. 
Um, Georgia, what are the other cases where the diet is not appropriate? So there are certain inherited metabolic disorders, which are usually diagnosed in infancy, that make it difficult or impossible for the body to burn fat for energy. Those are quite quite rare um, in most cases. I don't work with children. I work with adults. And so for the most part, I don't need to concern myself with those conditions. There are certain other medical illnesses if you have an acute medical illness and one that one that's currently active, such as such as pancreatitis, for example, any psychiatric emergency, if a person is in psychiatric crisis, that's not a good time to begin a ketogenic diet. Certain medications, so uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors, which are uh, very popular now for type two diabetes, they are blood sugar lowering medications. Most clinicians, including myself, do not prescribe ketogenic diets to people who are taking those medications because there's a risk of ketoacidosis, which is not ketosis. Ketosis is normal, natural, healthy, safe. Ketoacidosis, ketone levels are extremely high and can even potentially be quite medically serious or even fatal ketoacidosis. I could list many more. The reason why I don't want to list every single one of them is because I don't want to give the impression that this is the only information you would need to safely adopt this diet. What I want people to do is I want them to learn more about the diet and work with somebody. I mean, if you're taking any medications or have any health conditions, or especially if you have cardiac condition, kidney condition, if you're taking any kind of prescription medication, and if you have psychiatric risk history, if part of your symptoms have included suicidal thinking, if they've included serious manic symptoms, psychosis, self-injury, or aggressive thoughts, it's very important to understand that if you try this diet, you can, in, in a small number of cases, but enough worth mentioning, you can feel worse before you feel better during that transition period. That transition period must be carefully monitored. I think it's important to say that if, if you're not taking medication and you don't have a, a risk history and you, you don't have any serious health problems, there are lots and lots of people who go on a ketogenic diet without any professional help whatsoever. I would just say, be careful, be aware, consult with somebody if you can first. And if you start to feel worse, please stop the diet and then seek additional assistance. The diet itself is not dangerous. It's the transition period that warrants careful monitoring. So if someone's been listening to this and this podcast goes out across the world and they'd like to explore using nutrition to help treat their mental illness, where should they go to find out more? There are a number of of good resources now available. So I can start with the resources that I'm most familiar with, which are my website where all the information is free. It's called diagnosisdiet.com. There's a lot of information there about ketogenic diets, about food in general, different dietary patterns, nutrition science. That's also where clinicians who are interested in learning about how to prescribe ketogenic diet can learn about my training program. The next groups start in January. And then I would also recommend that they visit the Bazooki Brain Research Fund's website, which has just been launched recently. So it's a growing website, but I expect you to be able to find lots of information there in the coming months. Also, the Stanford University Metabolic Psychiatry Program that's headed by Dr. Shabani Sethi Delai at Stanford. There's a a Facebook group there that people can join. There's information there about clinical trials and information about the intersection between metabolic health and mental health. Those are some places that I would begin. And coming very soon in the next two weeks or so, I'll also have on my website a searchable clinician directory, where if you're looking for a clinician to support you with a metabolic diet for mental health condition, you can search that directory by clinician type or by area, and this is worldwide, and that's completely free. We really want people to be able to have access to this kind of care wherever they are and whatever type of condition they are working with. Another resource is the Diet Doctor website, dietdoctor.com. So that's another and largely free resource. And I'll put a link to all these websites in the show notes for this week's podcast. Thank you. I think the confusion for a lot of people is there's such mixed messaging about diet. I think most people would say eat less refined carbohydrates, eat less sugar. And everybody seems to universally agree that green leafy vegetables are a good thing. But after that, it's incredibly complicated. I interviewed Professor Tim Spector several weeks ago. He recommends that 
for our gut health, we should eat 30 plants a week. You'd probably have a fit. (laughs) Others will say that grains are really important. People like you will argue, well, actually, grains are sort of anti-nutrients because they can stop our bodies absorbing various things. So it is confusing for people trying to find their way through this. It's true. It's really confusing and it's unnecessarily confusing. I mean, nutrition is actually very simple. The problem is that nutrition science has lost its way. And so nutrition science, or I I should really put science in quotes, because most of the nutrition recommendations that we get that have us so confused, where the rules are constantly changing and where some of it doesn't even make biological sense, that, that information that most of us have about nutrition comes from an unscientific type of study called uh, nutrition epidemiology. And that's literally guesswork based on fatally flawed food frequency questionnaires, which do not measure or capture any real data. So these studies are based on no real data. It literally is guesswork. One of the things that I'm writing about now for my book, there'll be an entire chapter about nutrition epidemiology to help people understand why it is that the nutrition recommendations that people in the low carb community or the ketogenic community often recommend why some of those recommendations appear to fly in the face of nutrition, quote, science. The truth is that there is no science on the other side. And so we need to find some common ground. And the common ground is we know we need protein. We know we need a certain amount of protein. We know that we can fuel our bodies with either carbohydrates or fats or both either way. If you eat too much carbohydrate, it will turn into fat. If you eat too much fat and insulin levels are low enough, you can turn that into carbohydrate. So fat and carbohydrate are interchangeable in a certain sense, but you need a certain amount of protein. You need essential nutrients. And those nutrients are easiest to obtain in their most bioavailable form and in their least harmful form, their safest form from animal foods, non-dairy animal foods in particular, much harder to get from plants. There are exceptions, but I want to say that most of the nutrients we need are easier to obtain and safer to obtain from animal foods than plants. That does not mean that I think everybody should stop eating plants, but there are some plants which are really not worth eating and some plants which are actually working against your best efforts to be healthy. But the confusion comes from these epidemiological studies. So I advise people to listen to your gut. If you eat something and it's comfortable to digest and it's supporting your good metabolic health and your blood glucose and insulin levels can stay well eating those foods, um, you don't have any nutrient deficiencies, that food is probably going to be just fine for you to consume. But I would really argue strongly that the grains and legumes, really, they're not fit for human consumption. They're very, very risky foods to eat. They're extremely low in nutrients. They're extremely high in anti-nutrients, and uh, they're also very high in carbohydrates. So if you have poor metabolic health, those foods will not serve you well because you're you're not able to safely process carbohydrate anymore, sadly. So those should, in my opinion, after the refined carbohydrates and the seed oils, the junk foods, those should be the next on the list to practice getting rid of if you're trying to get healthier. One of the other things people talked about a lot is the longevity diet and blue zones around the world. And that tends to be mostly plant diet, certainly got grains, certainly got legumes. But of course, those people are leading a pretty physical lifestyle. And if you're leading a very physical lifestyle, you can presumably tolerate a higher level of carbohydrates. Two things to address there. So one is that, yes, I'm not in the camp that believes that carbohydrates destroy your health. I'm in the camp that believes that the wrong types of carbohydrates too often and and other types of foods, seed oils, and other types of uh, non-food ingredients, those are the things that are destroying your metabolic health. Once your metabolic health is destroyed, unfortunately, then even the whole food sources of carbohydrates, which I would argue never seemed to hurt people before, ancestral diets and hunter-gatherer diets, et cetera, some of those were quite high in starches from fruits and vegetables and quite high in carbohydrate. But the quality of the carbohydrate and the types of foods they're eating, very different from how we eat now. Those people were healthy. They didn't appear to develop diabetes or obesity or heart disease, a cancer or Alzheimer's disease to any significant extent, whereas we are now riddled with all of these problems in the past 50 to 75 years. So clearly our modern diet is playing a major role in our poor health. 
So take care of your metabolism. If you're young or, or still metabolically very healthy, stop eating the junky carbohydrates now to protect your metabolism so that you can continue to enjoy fruits and starchy vegetables for the rest of your life, which I no longer can safely do. But the other thing about the blue zones is that, that is also nutrition epidemiology. There are many, many flaws in those studies, not the least of which is that the people who are eating those diets, as you said, there were lots of different aspects of their lifestyle that were healthier. And I think it's much more about what they were not eating as opposed to what they were eating. Even if you argue they were eating more plants, which I take issue with, the original National Geographic article about the blue zones, which is one of the reasons why that particular way of eating or, or that particular body of information became popularized was through an, a National Geographic article. And if you look through that article, you will see pictures of people carrying slaughtered animals over their shoulders that they were going to eat for dinner. It's a fantasy. We would love to believe, and I understand why, we would love to believe that we would be better off eating an, a high plant, low meat or no meat diet. It would be wonderful if that were the case. Unfortunately, it's simply not biologically factual. We must include animal foods in our diet to be healthy, sad but true. We need to find a way to make that more sustainable. We need to find a way to make that more humane. We need to find a way to make that psychologically tolerable. We need to find a way because without those foods, our health will suffer. We will not get the nutrients we need. We will be resorting to foods which are really hard on the body and which rob the body of nutrients and which can damage metabolic health. So we need to find a way. The blue zones myth, and it is a myth, it's a lovely idea, but it's not based in fact. So Georgia, you've talked about the long-term effects on our brain's metabolism. And some people are now actually arguing that we should characterize Alzheimer's as type 3 diabetes. Yes, really, so much of the information we have about understanding how a ketogenic diet affects psychiatric health of the brain comes from a really robust evidence base from the Alzheimer's literature, because Alzheimer's has been studied for more than 20 years now very, very carefully. What's become clear from that body of research, uh, which is much more advanced than the body of research we currently have about other psychiatric conditions, what's become clear is that the fundamental problem that's driving the development of Alzheimer's disease is that the brain has difficulty accessing energy. Energy is almost everything to the brain because the brain is our highest energy organ, demands a constant supply of high quality energy. And if you don't have enough energy coming in, the cells cannot take care of themselves and they will die. And so what's become very clear from this research is that insulin resistance at the blood brain barrier where insulin can't get into the brain in the way it used to be able to is impairing the cell's ability to process glucose. And what happens then is you've got a low insulin, high glucose brain. You've got plenty of glucose, but not enough insulin to use it. And what happens there is something called cerebral glucose hypometabolism, which just is a fancy way of saying sluggish brain glucose processing. They've studied this in PET scans of, of young people, people in their 20s, and found sluggish brain glucose processing. So that's how I first became interested in this when I was working in, with college students. I thought these students are on their way, on the long, slow, silent path to Alzheimer's disease without even realizing it. And by the time there are any memory problems evident, the hippocampus, which is the center for learning and memory in the brain, has already shrunk by 10%. So it's happening just like diabetes happens over many, many years silent in the background. The same is true of Alzheimer's disease that if you're not taking care of your metabolic health, if your blood sugar and insulin levels are running too high too often, you are damaging your brain's ability to access energy, which can lead to any number of problems, depending on your genetic vulnerabilities. You could develop Alzheimer's, you could develop type 2 diabetes, you could develop heart disease, you could develop obesity, you could develop fatty liver disease. Any number of problems can occur, and it's really just a matter of Russian roulette, which one or more you're going to come down with. So pay close attention know your numbers, know your fasting insulin. When you go to your doctor, rather than having them just check a fasting glucose, which is only going to detect diabetes once it's really taken root, 
Ask them for a fasting insulin level. That's what you need to know. Look at your lipid panel. I think it's quite difficult to get a fasting insulin test in the UK, actually. Is it? Okay, well, then look at the other markers I talked about. So the triglycerides, HDL, look at your own home glucose reading, measure your waist to hip ratio. You want your waist circumference, the measurement around your waist to be less than half of your height. And if it's more than that, that's a very strong sign of insulin resistance. There are lots of simple things you can do to estimate your metabolic health without any fancy tests. Given that we know that diabetes is off the scale, mental illnesses are also rising. Does it frustrate you that more people are not pursuing this avenue? Well, you know, yes and no. Medical practice changes very slowly. Medical practitioners are very conservative by nature. And we're taught to be that way. We are taught that we are responsible for what happens to our patients. And so we're really very careful. We don't want anything to go wrong. It could result in a lawsuit. But worse than that, It could result in a bad outcome for your patient, which is the last thing any doctor wants. So I understand the hesitance, the hesitancy to to adopt a new strategy. What's frustrating to me is not so much medical practice because I understand what the barriers are there. What frustrates me is the, the nutrition information generating machine, the USDA nutrition policies, for example. The WHO Red Meat and Cancer Report The Eat Lancet report in 2019, which recommended a very, very low to no meat diet for the entire planet. And then the USDA recommending very strange dietary patterns keep us healthy. This information is incorrect. It comes from nutrition epidemiology, which is not data-driven. So that information is wrong because it's so ingrained in school systems and in, in the military and in dietitian training and in physician training. That information is so ingrained, that's what's making it so hard to change to a common sense approach to nutrition. And I think it may take another generation before it really shifts. It's really hard to change people's beliefs about diet in a short period of time. Although I am very hopeful because of social media, that people have access to information. They can learn about other ideas and they can weigh for themselves what they think makes the most sense and where they think the science actually lies. And I think that's really empowering for people. Well, I think it's interesting because certainly with diabetes, the the diet-driven approach came from patients, not doctors. Isn't that something? I mean, I think that so many of us clinicians, how do we learn? We learn through clinical practice. Literally, practice, the word practice means you practice, you get better. And one of the ways you get better is you listen to your patients. And they tell you what works and what doesn't work they tell you what helps and doesn't help. And that's how you get better as a clinician. You certainly don't come out of medical school knowing enough to be helpful to most patients. <laughs> but I think it's also a paradigm shift for doctors because the traditional medical school approach tends to be pharmaceutical. There's not a huge amount of time spent on diet. And the idea that diet could have such a impact both on physical and mental health, I think, it's still very difficult for many doctors to fully absorb. I think it is partly because medical schools don't teach nutrition. And so medical students may be interested in it. It's not taught. Four years of medical school training, I think we had about two or three hours of nutrition training in four years. And four years of psychiatry residency training at a Harvard program, we didn't talk about food once. Not even when it came to eating disorders. We just, food was not on our radar. And so we're baked into this system of, okay, figure out what the problem is with this condition, which enzyme or which molecule or which cell is the problem, and then find a drug or a surgical approach to deal with that problem. Rather than stepping back and seeing the entire picture, I think students are interested in that. And physicians, even if they are interested, don't have the time to to learn a new way of doing things. They are overwhelmed. And also it's very time consuming. So you need a team set up to help with these lifestyle strategies. You can't just say, oh, here's your diet. I'll see you in three months. It requires a lot of support and education so that people you can stick with it and see the results they're looking for. So it sounds like there's still quite a lot of work to do. Thank you so much, Georgia, (laughs) for speaking today. Really appreciate it. I really appreciate the opportunity. I hope it's been helpful to people. And thanks for your fantastic questions, Liz.
Thank you so much, George. It's so interesting to talk to you. Bye. So I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of What Your GP Doesn't Tell You. A reminder, you can sign up for the podcast mailing list at whatyourgpdoesnttellyou.com, get further details on my Substack newsletter, and follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker. Many thanks for listening. Bye for now. <laughs>